Alexandria Occasional Cortex has rolled out her Green New Deal, and by golly, it is the best Green New Deal ever. The cute and stupid congresswoman, and don't get me wrong, there's nothing I find more attractive than a cute, stupid congresswoman, put forward the plan that would completely eliminate all fossil fuels by the year Fantasia and replace them with energy from the sacred of a triaramanung tree from the movie Avatar. The Green Deal would be financed by happy money from the best possible dreams. So that, and this is a real quote from the plan's original FAQ, which has since mysteriously vanished. The question isn't how will we pay for it, but what will we do with our new shared prosperity? Unquote. Did I mention she's cute, too? The Green Deal seeks to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by, among other things, putting an end to cow flatulence and jet travel. The plant's creators do admit there may be problems trying to eliminate both cow flatulence and jet travel, because if cows have no gas, how will they be able to fly? And if cows can't fly, how will we get from place to place once we eliminate jet travel? Luckily, scientists have assured Alexandria Occasional Cortex they are working round the clock on this problem, and she should just go away now, and they'll call her when they have it solved. The Green New Deal not only guarantees a good-paying job for everyone, but also, another quote from that original FAQ, it guarantees economic security for all who are unable or unwilling to work, unquote. And lest you wonder how we'll pay for that, the people who are unwilling to work will be given free money, which will then be taxed to raise funds to pay the other people who are unwilling to work, so that eventually no one will have to work and we'll all be rolling in dough. Democrat presidential candidate Kamala Harris also endorsed the deal, but she's not that cute. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is zippity-zing. It's a wonderful day, hooray, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. So last week we were talking about the biggest lie the left tells itself, the lie that some people are good. Some people are good. They want more government power because they believe they are so good they would not abuse it. Rather than celebrate America for its greatness, the left attacks America for its sins, which implies that other countries don't have sins because they're good. And the left has flushed itself down the philosophical toilet of intersectional racism through the idea that white people are uniquely bad because other races, you guessed it, they're good. Because they've lost the Christian wisdom of original sin and embraced this ridiculous idea, they've lost the most important political sense you can have, the sense of cynicism. They think that right-wing politicians are mean, evil, and racist. Okay, but they think left-wing politicians are just trying to help. Not so okay. They buy into climate change hysteria with a naivete of little children. They want to give their leaders the power to silence conservative speech because they just know they would never abuse such a power because they're good. They buy into the idea of their own good intentions because they look in the mirror and they think, how could I ever distrust a face like that? These mokes have been sold the Brooklyn Bridge of socialism, the idea that powerful people can control production and wealth better than the individuals on the scene, because it never seems to occur to them that powerful people just want more and more power. No, they're nice. They just want to be fair. The left are gullible. They're naive. They're knuckleheads. We're going to show how this works exactly. But first, look at this shirt. Is this a great shirt or not? This is an un- Tuck it shirt. In Hollywood, this is absolutely true. In Hollywood, everyone wears a shirt untucked. It's a, it's a way of being young. You know, you, everybody has to be young in Hollywood once you reach a certain age, age you're out. So everybody wants to look young, so they keep their shirt untucked. But the problem is, normal shirts just don't look very good untucked. Untuck it solves that problem. It actually makes a shirt that is designed, specifically designed, to be worn untucked. And it looks great. I mean, you can see this one. It is just terrific. Uh, it's not too long. It's not too short. It gives you a clean, casual look that you can even wear at the office, like I am doing right this minute, uh, with more than 50 fit combinations. Untuck it shirts look great on tall, short, slim, and athletic guys of all ages. And I know because I'm all of those. Go to untuckit.com or visit one of Untuck It's 50 stores across the U.S. and Canada 
Untuck It even offers free shipping and returns on all orders in the U.S. Use promo code Claven for 20% off your first purchase. That's a good deal. If you want the perfect fitting shirt, regardless of your shape and size, try the original Untucked shirt. And remember, use that promo code Claven for 20% off your first purchase. And I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yeah, but how do you, how do you spell Claven? There are no E's in Claven. That's the key. I make it look easy so people get confused, but there are no E's. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. Here's the thing. I believe in Jesus. I believe that one day Jesus will come back. A guy comes on TV and says, it's the end times, and if you send me just $15, I will help you navigate yourself through the end times, and I'll heal your asthma too. I, I think to myself, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe you just want my $15. Maybe you don't know anything more about this than anybody else, and maybe you're just trying to take my money away. But when people come to the left and they, and they say, it's the, the environment, the end of the It's terrible. Everything's going to die. We're all going to die. Unless, unless you give me all the power and money, then uh, it'll be fine. The left is like, okay, you look nice. You must, uh, that must be good. I hate capitalism. I hate industry. I hate private, indus- private property and people getting rich. So if you tell me the world is going to end because of all those things, you must be telling the truth and you must be a good person. It's not, it's insane. It is insane. It is gullibility to the degree of insanity. It's gullibility raised to an art. So they bring out this new green deal and it's nuts. And the hilarious thing is this, is they put out an FAQ. This is Alexandria Occasional Cortex. She puts out this FAQ. It was written by her chief of staff and it, it gets so badly mocked and so badly uh, torn to shreds that she says, well, the, uh, the RNC hacked into my uh, computer and changed it all. And we didn't. That was an early draft. She's lying. She was lying. The, the underlying uh, info in the, in the computer shows that it was her document. She put it out. And the stuff in it, it, it wasn't even the stuff everybody made fun of, like, you know, we'll, we'll pay you if you're unwilling to work. It was just the absolute idea, the right idea. It says the Green New Deal resolution is a 10-year plan to mobilize every aspect of American society at a scale not seen since World War II to achieve a net zero greenhouse gas emissions and create economic prosperity for all. Why would you not believe that? And have you noticed that it's not World War II? I mean, has anybody (laughs) happened to notice? They keep talking about this. But has anybody thought like, yeah, but... Uh, excuse me, ex- uh, a hand in the back. It's it's not World War II. Why are we mobilizing the country? This will move America to 100% clean and renewable energy. I think we're now at about 10% and you can't really store it. And it doesn't, you know, the wind keeps stopping. The sun goes down. It doesn't work as well. It doesn't work as well as fossil fuels, which can be incredibly clean and they won't even use nuclear energy. They won't. They said no nuclear energy because it's it's like a a cult. It is. It's like the superstition. Nobody except a Chernobyl has ever died from nuclear energy. It can be done cleanly. That was a problem with the Soviet Union, not with nuclear energy. Just amazing. Ensure it will ensure a just transition for all communities and workers to ensure economic security for people in communities that have historically relied on fossil fuel industries. It will ensure justice and equity for frontline communities by prioritizing investment, training, climate, and community resiliency, economic and environmental benefits for these communities. It will build on FDR's second Bill of Rights by guaranteeing a job with a family-sustaining wage. A job with a family-sustaining wage, family and medical leave, vacations and retirement security, high-quality education, including higher education and trade schools, clean air and clean water, access to nature, healthy food, high-quality health care, safe, affordable, adequate housing, economic environment, free of monopolies, economic security for all who are unable or unwilling to work. And if you just take one bottle of this a day, your hair will grow back and you will be potent once again, you folks. It's... <laughs> It's like, it's insane. It is like, it is snake oil. How could anybody, how could anybody look at this? If somebody is trying to sell me snake oil, would I say to myself, well, yeah, it's snake oil, but, you know, it's the idea. It's we're working toward these things. Well, a con man is a con man is a con man. This is, it's just all a con. And so, of course, the first thing people ask is, how are you going to pay for this? And Alexandria, occasional cortex, she has, has one, you know, somebody, by the way, somebody wrote me a letter 
saying, I, you stole a Alexandria Occasional Cortex from Michael Savage, and you've got to credit him. I've never listened to Michael Savage. I don't know what he's saying, but uh, I'm sure he didn't catch it from me. It's, it's kind of a gimme. It's kind of built into her name. But anyway, she explains where the money is going to come from. This is cut number five. The first thing that we need to do is is kind of break the mistaken idea that taxes pay for 100% of government expenditure. It's just not how government expenditure works. We can recoup costs, but oftentimes you look at, for example, the GOP tax cut, which I think was an irresponsible use of government expenditure, but government projects are often financed by a combination of taxes, uh, deficit spending, and other kinds of, of investments, you know, bonds and, and so Well, I get on. that, but deficit spending is borrowing money that has to be paid back eventually through taxes. Yeah, and I think, well, th I think that is always the crux of it. So when we decide to to go into the realm of deficit spending, we have to do so responsibly. We ask, is this an investment or is this actually going to pay for itself? So you're saying borrow the money, make the investment, the economy will grow, we'll pay off the debt. Absolutely, because we're creating jobs. <laughs> That's economics for knuckleheads, economics for stupid people. <laughs> like the government makes no money. The government creates no jobs. There are government jobs, but they always cost more than normal jobs. They're actually taking jobs away. They're always a net loss in jobs. Why? Because in order to create the jobs, you've got to collect the taxes. You've got to move the taxes. Each dollar is being uh, decimated by going through the government process. If I hire somebody, it's like, you give me money because I'm selling you soap. Then I use the money that I got, the profit I got for soap to hire somebody. It's just a clean deal and I create jobs. The government never creates jobs. The government takes takes people's money, which would be used for creating jobs, and makes fewer jobs. That's that's how that works. So it's like she just. But the idea that deficit spending is not taxes is is just wonderful. We just spend it ahead. You know, even on Knucklehead Row, the op-ed page of the New York Times, even on Knucklehead Row, there was an op-ed that was mostly knuckleheaded, but actually said something important. Let's let's go over to the New York Times and Knucklehead Row. Oh, hey, hey, oh, hey, ho. Let's go waltzing down to Knucklehead Row. So this is by Stephen Ratner, who served as counselor to the Treasury Secretary in the Obama administration, right? This is not some crazed right winger speaking the truth. I hate when they do that. This is a guy who's willing to lie. Most of this op-ed is nonsense, but he says, oh, actually, it's not nonsense. It's just slanted. But here it's called Your Ch Grandchildren are already in debt. And here is how it goes. It says, Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, free college tuition. Remember, this is a knucklehead row. This is in the New York Times, a former newspaper. With each new entrant into the Democratic presidential sweepstakes comes a fresh cascade of ambitious social programs to entice and excite would-be supporters. The list of pay-fors, to use a bit of Washington jargon, grows more slowly. They'll pay for this how again? Tax the rich, tax the rich, or take cover behind a convenient bit of progressive dogma. Don't worry about the fiscal impact because America's rising budget deficits and debt levels don't much matter. That's a scary drift of thought, and it should set off alarm bells for all Americans. Vast increases in debt will ultimately compromise Washington's ability to maintain its current array of spending programs, let alone add new ones and threaten our standard of living. This is from an Obama guy who then goes on in the rest of the piece to blame the Republicans for all the deficit spending, which, you know, actually has an aspect of fairness to it. They've all done it. Everybody's done it. But at least at least somebody at The New York Times, which is basically now just an anti-Trump hate rag, is speaking out against this kind of nonsense. 1-800-Flowers. You know, some of you, some of you guys out there may actually realize that it's the 11th of February and that means Valentine's Day is right around the corner. That's three days left for those of you, like my fellow English majors who can't do math. You want to go to 1-800-Flowers. There's still time to win Valentine's this year with a gorgeous bouquet of vibrant red and pink roses from my pals at 1-800-Flowers.com. Let me tell you, that these guys sent me this bouquet. They forgot to give it to me, so I got it a day late. I then, stupidly but typically, left it in the trunk of my car another day. I took it out still fresh. That's how fresh the flowers are at 1-800-Flowers.com. They're still, this is a couple of days now, and they are still on the counter in the kitchen. They look absolutely terrific. 
18 romantic roses for just $29.99. So many unbelievable deals from 1-800-Flowers. To order Valentine's bouquets, arrangements, and more, starting at $29.99, like 18 romantic red roses for $29.99. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com, click the radio icon, and enter code CLAVEN. Order today and save at 1-800-Flowers.com, code Clavin, that's the guy who leaves flowers in the trunk of his car overnight, and it's spelled K-L-A-V-A-N. So then, you know, the other side of this, of course, is the the government takeover that it represents, this Green New Deal. And this is the thing. Whenever you hear people, Obama used to do this all the time, we need to invest. We need to invest. My immediate question, and no, not one reporter ever asked this question. My immediate question is, why do you get to invest my money? Why don't I get to invest my money? Why not? Why isn't my decision to invest my money on a dinner for my wife at a local restaurant? Why isn't that better than your uh, um, power? You're taking the power to invest the money I earned, the money I went to work for, I earned, and you invested in some uh, company that gave you money, like one of your solar panel friends, uh, you know, that that wants the money from the government. Why is that right? Why is that moral? I do not see the morality of that. So whenever they talk about the morality of that, they're really talking about government takeovers because the people are gullible, right? So here here is AOC being asked in the morning about this on radio and then explaining at night. These are two different cuts spliced together on the same day of whether or not this represents a massive government takeover. Are you prepared to put on the table that Yes, actually, they're right. What this requires is massive government intervention. It does. It does. Yeah, I have no problem saying that. Uh, uh, I think one one way that the right does try to mar- mischaracterize uh, what we're doing as though it's like some kind of massive government takeover. <laughs> so it's a it's a massive government takeover. But that lousy right, they're telling people it's a massive government takeover. And the, the, the gull- you know just the fact that nobody stops on the left, nobody stops and says, "Well, wait just a minute. Wait just a minute. What is going?" Going on here. Listen, listen to Cory Booker. Cory Booker endorsed this. Kamala Harris endorsed this. And in their endorsements, they show the the way they induce this gullibility in people who are asking for it. I mean, everybody wants to believe. Everybody wants to believe that their guys are the good guys. Here on the right, we actually do question people. You know, it was never it, the right. When Reagan was president, the right ripped him apart. Now we have these guys who are never Trumpers and everybody picks on them, but at least they're not worshiping uh, their leaders. The leader is not the guy. The ideas are what we're after. I say Trump has done a good job because he's implemented good ideas. I don't trust everything he says. I don't believe everything he says. And I don't let him carry me away with passion. You know, this is what the left does. So here's Cory Booker endorsing this thing, this crazy thing. Our planet is in peril and we need to be bold. <clears throat> It's one of the reasons why I signed on to the resolution, a co-sponsor of the resolution for the Green New Deal. And there's a lot of people now that are blowing back on the Green New Deal. They're like, oh, it's impractical. Oh, it's too expensive. Oh, it's all of this. If we used to govern our dreams that way, we would have never gone to the moon. God, that's impractical. You see that ball in the sky? That's impractical. We, we, We are a nation that has done impossible things before. And my parents taught me, reach for, the, reach for the moon, reach for the stars. And even if you come up short, at least you're going to be hovering above the ground. You'll be soaring, young man. And so we need to be bold again in America. We need to have dreams that other people say are impossible. We need to push the bounds of human potential because that is our history. And when the planet has been in peril in the past, who came forward to save Earth? From the scourge of, of Nazi and totalitarian regimes, we came forward. I thought it was Captain Marvel. I went, <laughs> yes, who came forward to save Earth? You know, the planet was in peril. The, you know, the planet is in peril. So you're supposed to panic and not ask too many questions. The planet is in peril. The planet is in peril. And anyone who disagrees, anyone who disagrees is a denier. Remember those holocaust deniers? Well, this has the same word in it. So it's the same thing. I mean, the fact that anyone of intelligence, of any kind of normal intelligence, buys into this. The people don't say, hold on, hold on. What happens if I don't panic? What happens if I just proceed with due deliberate speed and check out the facts and read up on this? And what if, what if every time somebody says, panic and give me power, panic and give me money, I think and it's the same as that guy on TV going, send me $15 and put your hand on the TV screen and I will heal you. It's the same damn thing. And it's like, why don't they have any kind of cynicism? 
any kind of question. The gullibility is amazing. It is an amazing level. So it's it, A, it's the panic, and then B, it's the silencing. It is the silencing of people who disagree. Here's Kamala Harris also buying into this monstrosity. I support a Green New Deal, and I will tell you why. Climate change is an existential threat to us, and we have got to deal with the reality of it. We have got to deal with the reality of the fact that there are people trying to peddle some idea that we should deny it, and they are peddling science fiction instead of what we should do, which is rely on science fact. So that's the other aspect of this, right? It's, it's panic, don't think, and also don't let anybody argue. Do not let anybody argue. We have science fiction, and then we have science fact. And anybody who's telling you that I'm wrong, anybody who's telling you not to give me the power, anybody telling you not to increase government power is just dealing in science fiction. You know, there is an article in City Journal. I love City Journal. I'm a uh, contributing editor there, just to be uh, open about it. But I also think it's a great, great magazine. Uh, they put out things on their dead tree issue uh, first, and then they put them up online. So this will eventually be up online at the website City Journal. It's a, an article by Guy Sorman, which is basically an interview with this climatologist, Judith Curry, who has stepped out of the academic world because she says that climate science has simply become too political to get at the truth. And this is what she says. She says, scientists are human beings with human motives. Nowadays, public funding Scientific awards and academic promotions go to the environmentally correct. Among climatologists, a person must not like capitalism or industrial development too much and should favor world government rather than nations. That's how science is being constructed in the climatology business, right? So it's not science anymore, it's politics. And here she is explaining why she didn't buy into it. Well, climate science has become highly politicized and the strategy used um, by the climate community to influence public policy is speaking consensus to power. So over the past several decades, they worked to build this consensus. And following the 2009 Climate Gate episode, I started challenging the consensus, saying, wait a minute, uh, we haven't been sufficiently transparent. We haven't adequately characterized the uncertainties. We shouldn't be dismissing skeptics. I mean, we have to do a better job. And I started saying things like that that I thought were completely reasonable. But I was immediately thrown out of the tribe, if you will, mm. um, and labeled as a heretic, denier, whatever else. So climate gate, if you don't remember, is that time they hacked into the emails of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and they found emails from Michael Mann and other people uh, basically saying we must not let the public for one moment doubt what we're doing. Uh, and they've been covering that up that they've been covering that up forever. And I remember Stephen Colbert going on the air saying, well, just because they said that doesn't mean they're lying. And of course, that's true, but it does mean you should just be a little bit cynical since they're asking for power, since they're asking for money, since they're benefiting from an industry that uh, wants them to have a certain kind of opinion. But just a little bit of cynicism, a little bit of uh, slow it down a little bit, a little bit of doubt. I, it's, it's amazing that the left cannot catch on to this because they think it's, it's a battle between good and evil instead of imperfect people, each of them out for his own interest, which is really what politics is all about. Sherry's berries. You've given your wife flowers. You've given your girlfriend flowers, but you also want to add some of these Sherry's berries. I'm sure you have heard me and Shapiro talking about this. We are not just talking about this on the air. We are talking about it off the air, how incredibly good Sherry's berries are. They are these the, the, these strawberries, they, I don't know how they get them so big. They're just beautifully uh, grown, big, fresh strawberries. They're dipped in milk, dark or white chocolatey goodness for anybody who likes that taste. And I do. It's just uh, absolutely great. That's their signature thing. You can get uh, a, a box of the berries dipped in chocolatey goodness that arrives fresh with 100 percent Sherry's Berries guarantee. It ships anywhere nationally and it gives you so, so you can give sweet somethings to your long distance love. Valentine, I think I may sing that next time. Valentine. Valentine's Day is just a few days away. Send her the Valentine's gift of her dreams at the price of your dreams, starting at just $19.99 plus shipping and handling. Plus, order now and make this Valentine's really special by getting double the berries for just $10 more. Go to berries.com, click on the microphone, enter my code CLAVEN at checkout. That's B E R R I E S.com. Click the microphone and enter code 
Clavin today. And I know you're thinking B-E-R. I know how to spell berries, but how do you spell Clavin? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. Uh, so what can we believe about climate change? What should we believe? Seriously, I mean, every, everybody who says this always starts out saying, I've read the science, I know the science. Well, I have read a lot about it, and I'm not pretending to be a climate scientist, but this is what I think is, I think it's pretty fair to say this. The climate changes. Climate always changes. The, the Great Lakes used to be glaciers, you know. I mean, climate has been changing since there's been climate. It may be changing quicker now. It is very unclear. It's very unclear. Human beings definitely have an effect, but they do not know how much of an effect they have. They do not know. I mean, it only makes sense that human beings have an effect. Each one of us, even before we have industry, each one of us is a little light bulb, you know, a little energy producing thing. You know, we're going to warm things up around us. But, you know, we also have built industries. We've built all these things. So the question is not, uh, is it the end of the world? The question is, what, what's the balance here? What do we want? We don't want a world without pollution. You think we want a world without pollution, but we don't because we want a world with industry. We want a world, we do want a world with jet travel. You know, I mean, the cows, no matter how much gas they have, the cows are not going to fly. I love, <laughs> loved AOC in this Green Deal said, we're going to replace uh, jet travel with fat, high speed trains is going to be half, very high speed uh, if you're first of all to beat jets and second of all if you're going to be able to hold your breath under the Atlantic Ocean they're going to have to be really fast have to go about 30 seconds across the Atlantic Ocean so we have an effect the the way climate change works is not that well understood. This is a really important thing about science. They never talk about how little they know. They know very little about this. It's a very, very complicated thing. They do not know how climate science, how climate change works, and they're not sure how much of human uh, enterprise goes into this. And if you say that, you're fired. If you say that, you're fired. And that's telling. That in and of itself is telling. The sea levels are definitely rising. They've been rising since the Victorian era, so it cannot be because of modern um, because of modern industry. It's been going on a long time. And, you know, as uh, Bjorn Lomborg always says, it's not like we're going to look down and say, oh, you know, the sea have risen. My socks are wet. I think I'll just stand here for another hundred years till I drown. That's the way it works. We will adjust. It's also, we'll also adjust to warmer temperatures, if there are warmer temperatures, which is also not clear. It's also not clear whether the uh, climate is actually on a warming trend that's going to continue. That is not clear either. But if it does continue, remember, more people die of the cold than die of the warm. So there may be benefits to climate change. There may be new places that open up where we can grow food. We just don't know what that's going to be. And even the worst estimated costs um, even the worst estimated costs are not that bad because our economy grows and our economy has been growing at such a rate that the costs of dealing with climate change, just dealing with it, not stopping it, the costs of dealing with it are really not all that bad. So there's a lot to ask about this. And there's just serious questions about how much government can do. The Paris Climate Accords, if everyone hit their mark on the Paris Climate Accords, right, everyone hit their mark. And if the climate models are correct, all, both of which are very highly doubtful, but if all of that happened, it would take to make a difference of two tenths of a degree, which is not enough to make a difference. So the climate, the Paris Climate Accord was nonsense from the beginning. And when Trump left it and everybody said, oh, that's the end of the world, it wasn't even the end of the Paris Climate Accord because no one was doing it anyway. You know, this woman, Judith Curry, she points out that the science is far from settled, but just... But just on general principles, forget about what she's saying just for a minute, just on general principles, the UN says it's a crisis, energy, the power over energy should be given to the UN. The US government says it's a crisis, power over the energy industry should be given to the US government. A little suspicion, a little, just a little bit of doubt, a little cynicism. When people are asking you for power, when people are asking you for money, Power you know that they'll never give back. Money you know you'll never see again. Power you know will only expand. When people are asking you for things, when they're telling you it's an emergency, when they're telling you to panic, when they're telling you not to think, when they're telling you anyone who disagrees must be silenced, just on general principles, a little bit of doubt. All right, I got a break from YouTube and Facebook. Come over to dailywire.com. And while you're there, here's an idea. Subscribe. It's a lousy 10 bucks a month. Hundred bucks you get for the you get a subscription for the entire year. You get the leftist tears tumbler. You get to ask questions in the mailbag, which means your problems will be solved. So you're talking about a hundred bucks, all your problems solved. 
it's a good deal. It's a good deal. And plus, you have the money. We want the money. You'll just spend it on something foolish this way. You give it to us. We will entertain you and answer all your questions. Come over to dailywire.com. You know, this, this thing in uh, Virginia, which just continues to get funnier and funnier, although you know, I wrote a piece, you can read it on the Daily Wire website, a column uh, about the idea that maybe we should look at the Virginia as a teachable moment. Maybe this is a moment to teach uh, Democrats about all the stuff that they're doing wrong. The world that they created, this world that's falling apart in Virginia is a world that Democrats created, a world where there's no forgiveness for past sins, a world where the country can't be forgiven for its past sins, a world where individuals can't be forgiven for their past sins, a world of, of this intersectional racism. I want to talk more about that because that is a, certainly a gullible thing. Intersectional Intersectionality is not just racism, it's primitivism. It's going back to tribalism. It's saying the tribes are going to be, uh, the tribal system is better than the melting pot. So here's what's happening. Ralph Northam, you remember the guy. He's the guy who had the, uh, on, his, on his medical uh, school yearbook, had the picture that may have been of him. At first he said it was of him, and then he said it wasn't of him. A guy in a Ku Klux Klan hood with another white guy in blackface. Obviously an insensitive picture, not a, not a good picture. But again, this is 36 years ago. He was in his 20s. So he is just holding fast. Every Democrat and his sister is calling on him to resign. But Northam says he's not going. Here's uh, him saying this yet again. We have worked very hard. Uh, we've had a good first year. And, and I'm a leader. Uh, I've been in some very difficult situations, life and death situations, taking care of sick children. And right now, you're a doctor, yes. right now, Virginia needs someone that can heal. Uh, there's no better person to do that than a doctor. Virginia also needs someone who is strong, who has empathy, who has courage, and who has a moral compass. And that's why I'm not going anywhere. I have learned from this. I have a lot more to learn, but we're in a unique opportunity now. I, again, the 400 year anniversary of, of uh, the history, whether it be good or bad uh, in Virginia, to really make some impactful changes. Love in slavery in this country, yes. in this state, yeah. Did you ever think about resigning when the drumbeat became so loud? And by the way, they're still beating for you to step down. I don't live in a vacuum. And yes. so, yes, I, I have heard it. And I've had, this has been a difficult week. So, so he's not going anywhere. Uh, he is dug in. And, you know, the, the left, the Democrats, have this incredible problem of their own making. It is a problem of philosophy. Their philosophy has blown up in their faces uh, it, it just in terms of not just in terms of political efficacy of what they want to have happen, but also of just nonsense, of the, finding themselves in a nonsensical position. Because the lieutenant governor, who actually has a black face, who is not wearing black face, he's an actual black guy, he has this problem that he's now being accused of rape. A second woman has come forward with a detailed story about his raping her. He denies it utterly. He's called for an FBI investigation. And obviously, I'm in favor of due process. The funny thing is, is the worse the crime is, the more due process is important because you don't convict somebody of rape without proof, without evidence. We said this about Brett Kavanaugh. I'll say about Justin Fairfax. But here's the problem, right? The Democrats after going after uh, Brett Kavanaugh, and they've kept that myth alive. They're going to keep it alive forever. Oh, my gosh, there's this, you know, rapist. They did it with Clarence Thomas. They still accuse him. He, Clarence Thomas was never conveyed. Even what Clarence Thomas was accused of with Anita Hill would, would have just been pesky. It wouldn't have been that terrible. But he says he didn't do that either. But they continue to talk about him as if he were a sexual abuser. I mean, you really have this picture of the Supreme Court in the Democrats' minds of, like, Republican men <laughs> chasing the women around the, the, the you know, Supreme Court desk. Uh, like in just kind of the sex mad uh, chaos, you know, I can really see, you know, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, the rest of them like running away with Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh <laughs> chasing after them and say, help, help, you know, it's, it's not, that's obviously not what's happening, but they went after Brett Kavanaugh with such ferocity, with such nastiness, with such dishonesty that now they've got a problem, right? If they treat Justin Fairfax, the way they treated Brett Kavanaugh, and they won't because if they didn't have double standards, they'd have no standards at all. You would have a situation where Ralph Northam appeared possibly in blackface, certainly fronted this picture of uh, the Ku Klux Klan and this black guy on his on his page on the med school yearbook. You'd have the guy 
who's under Justin Fairfax, the secretary of state who also admitted to appearing at a party in blackface, although in a more innocent way, he was pretending to be a rap singer. In between them, you've got an actual black guy who's accused of a crime. If that crime is proved or becomes incredibly convincing, right, if the women come forward and their stories are so good and they have evidence and they, you know, corroboration and they are incredibly convincing, you could have a situation where two white guys in Virginia are accused of wearing blackface and survive and the only guy who gets thrown out is the black guy, okay? So you have this kind of nonsense situation that is created. It's only nonsense, of course, because of the uh, left's the left's philosophy. Plus, of course, we talked about this last week, if all three guys go, the next guy down is a Republican. So they would lose the state. And you can bet, you can bet cash money that that is not going to happen. So here is here's my my problem with this. They created the situation with this intersectional nonsense. And intersectionality is simply racism with a smiley face. That's all it is. It's the idea that we can be divided according to how we've suffered. We can be divided according to how we were oppressed and then kind of ranked. And the people who are more oppressed now get better treatment. The people who are less oppressed. But of course, it's nonsense because the whole thing about racism is the racist isn't wrong about the other guy when he says the other guy sucks. Everybody sucks. He's wrong about himself. He's wrong about his group, whatever it is. If it's a white guy hating on black guys, hey, hate on black guys all you want, but you got to know white people are just as bad. Whatever, whatever you can say about black people, you can say about white people. People are bad. People are sinful. They're broken. That's the problem, see? So the problem is not like, oh, well, the white people mistreated the black people. Now the black people should mistreat the white people and then everything will be fine. All the racism goes in one side of the scale. The only thing that goes on the other side of that scale is justice, and justice has to begin today. And that means the past can't be fixed. That means unfairness is going to happen because the past can't be fixed. And yet, and yet, interestingly enough, that has never stopped other people who suffered from bigotry from moving forward. The Italians suffered bigotry, they move forward. The Jews move forward. The Irish move forward. The blacks are stuck because, because the left will not let them move forward. It will, and I, by the way, I understand I am fighting the tide like King Canute here. I am a radical about this. I believe racism has to be ditched entirely. It has to be ditched entirely. And I understand that's a radical position. And sometimes when I'm talking to young people, I see that they don't even understand what I'm talking about. How can we ditch uh, racism entirely when that means that the past can't be fixed? The point is, Even if you cling to racism, the past still can't be fixed. The past can never be fixed. That's what makes it the past. As William Faulkner said, the past uh, is not past. (laughs) That's that's the truth. The past is with us. It causes injustice in the present and there's not one thing you can do about it except, except from today, leave the racism behind. And that means no intersectionality. It means no affirmative action. It means no reparations, but it also means no bigotry. It also means hiring a guy without thinking about what color he is. It means bringing people forward, making sure there's education in all communities. And the best way to do that, of course, is to privatize education, but that's not going to happen. But still, that would be the best way to do it. That's, I, I understand this is a radical position now. It's a radical position because it is the American position, the true American position, the founding American position is always the most radical position for the simple reason there's only been one new idea in politics, and that is the American idea. And the other side of this, of course, is all these people have tried to turn this around and dump it on Trump. This has been an amazing, it was an amazing weekend that way. You know, Trump delivered a State of the Union and it was spectacular and people loved it. And it really, I think it's, it's given him already a bump in his popularity rating. And I think if he can keep to that uh, tone, which is a big if, but if he can keep to that tone, his popularity will continue to grow and he'll actually have a chance for reelection. So at one point, Nancy Pelosi clapped at his face, you know, because he celebrated women. She gave this kind of sardonic clap in his face. That has become a meme on the left because they want to convince that, oh, he, she won the State of the Union. Crap. It's just crap. It is just them tra- telling themselves fairy tales. And another one of their fairy tales. Oh, and then, oh, the other one is Pocahontas. I should mention this. Elizabeth Warren is caught out uh, having in the 80s listed herself as an American Indian on a bar association a- application. It's just incredibly humiliating. It, dis- it, it proves that she was lying when she said she never tried to benefit from identifying herself as an American Indian. She did. 
Trump makes his Pocahontas joke and immediately, oh, Trump's racist Pocahontas, was racist. What? I don't see anything racist about it. She is the one who did this. It's on her. That's the news. That's the headline. That's the story. They keep trying to change it. With this Virginia story, they have made efforts to say, well, you know, it is Trump in the 80s, I guess, who it is Trump who has made the society so racist. It's Trump who has made the society so racist. And that's why Ralph Northam back in the 80s had a picture of a Ku Klux Klan man on his med school yearbook. <laughs> that's why, because Trump would later come along and make America racist. And that would kind of ripple back through time. And then Ralph Northam would do what he did. So it's really not the Democrats fault. It's really not Northam's fault. It's all Donald Trump's fault. So it was a little bit gratifying when one leftist uh, actually challenged another leftist, Nina Turner, who is a Democrat, challenged Congresswoman Nanette Barrigan on this tactic on CNN, which at least was had the benefit of being surprising and shocking. Here's the clip. You can't forget about the person who is dividing us and who himself is injecting this into the country to live up again and, and coming out again. And we haven't seen it be this bad in recent time till the president has really made this um, a race issue, whether it's about um, African-Americans. Certainly, he's doing it all over the board with immigrants, but hey, we need mm. to have this conversation. I cannot. Well, I just can't. 1984, 1980, right. Gucci just a few days ago. This is not about President Donald Trump. This is about racism in the United States of America. Congresswoman, I hear you, but on this, we're not blaming President Trump. I'm he saying he that he has, listen, he let, has divided no, this country. No, let me, let me just say this. He is using it's easy. I issue. am not going to let continue to let politicians <laughs> use this man as the excuse to deal with racism in this country. See, now, I don't I, I always hate when people say racism in the United States of America, racism in this country, as if other countries were just wonderful paradises of non-racist thought. I mean, Race has been the way people have thought about each other since the beginning of time. Race has divided us and tribalism has divided us. That's why I'm a radical about it. I say get rid of it. I say just, just don't do it anymore. Don't, have any, don't group people by their races anymore. Let, you want to get together and have an Irish party? Good for you. You want to get together and have a black party or Jewish party, whatever? Have a good time. But in terms of policy, in terms of actually approaching people, I have this radical idea. I call it Christianity. It's man was made in God's image. God said, love God and love man. That's it. That's my rule. That's a radical rule. But still, so I don't agree with this lady, but at least she wasn't gullible. At least she didn't go down that road that in 1985, something that Donald Trump would do or say in 2019 made Ralph Northam, you know, I mean, a little bit of cynicism. It, Saturday Night Live. This is, we'll call this our crappy culture. Let's do the our crappy culture song. So I am not allowed to play this clip. And the reason I'm not allowed to play the clip is if a conservative plays a Saturday Night Live clip on YouTube, they take us down immediately. If a liberal does it, I do not think they will do it. I don't think they will. They only come after us. But so I can't play it. But it was embarrassing. SNL has embarrassed itself a number of times. Like, remember the one where they sang Hallelujah after <laughs> Hillary lost? Well, this was this was just as bad, if not worse. It was the women of Congress being portrayed as superheroes. They've come to stop crime. AOC is going to stop crime. Nancy Pelosi. Nancy she clapped back Pelosi is going to stop. It was just embarrassing. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know, attack, please, please, your comedians attack the right. But don't take prison, you know, attack the left as well. That's what's funny. You guys who couldn't find a joke about the smooth obsidian wall of Barack Obama, this dope smoking, corrupt uh, Chicago Democrat, you couldn't find a joke about him. And you but you can find a joke about Donald Trump every week. Don't sit down and suddenly lose your comic chops because you're dealing with Democrats. It's insane. It's insane. Uh, Alexandria Occasional Cortex is a dangerous woman because she's pretty, she's stupid, and she's vicious. There's not a bad thing I would say about Donald Trump that I wouldn't also say about AOC. She is not a good person. She is a stupid person. And what she puts forward and she, li when, and she lies and she attacks when she's challenged because she doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, come on. A little bit, a little bit of cynicism about your own side. You can still support the things you support, but just have a little bit of cynicism. Don't be taken in. Ilhan Omar, the one of the uh, 
new Muslim congresswoman. She's an anti-Semite. She's been tweeting this stuff about, uh, you know, support for Israel. It's all about the Benjamins. It's all about the money because, you know, those Jews, those Jews, that's all they care about. That's, that's, this proves my point, by the way. This thing that Jews only care about money like everybody else is just an absolute paragon of gen- generosity. It's just the Jews who care about money. So she attacks that. She's an anti-Semite. She is an anti-Semite, and she, you know, and she now she's talking about we should defund homeland security. I mean, she's like it's like a cartoon of an Islamic mole in the Congress. Like, let's defend, defund homeland security. Those people keep opening my bags. They keep taking out things with wires sprunging out of it just because I'm a Muslim woman. You know, it's like a joke. It's like it's like a bad parody of something. And they can't find humor about that. SNL can't find any humor on the left. Only on the right. That's gullible. That is a kind of stupid, one-sided way to look at the world, and it's bad comedy too. All right, that's all I have to say. Damn it! We'll come back here tomorrow. I think I'm coming on late tomorrow, aren't I? All right. So if you're watching live, if you like to watch live, I will be on at 11:30. I'm Andrew Claven. This is the Andrew Claven Show. <laughs> The Andrew Clavin Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And our animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Andrew Clavin Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019.